sing and stand with me if you can and will. Let's do number 12 in your maroon handle just over in the glory land. Be seated. Let's do uh, 223, Heaven's Jubilee. Coming out. 
Take your Bibles tonight and turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 as we go over article 5. Article 5 of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. That is our statement of faith as Southern Baptist. We have a statement of faith that explains what it is that we believe based upon the Bible. Article 5 is God's purpose of grace now we just talked about salvation two weeks prior to this on a Sunday night and tonight we'll talk about grace and you know there are some debates in the Southern Baptist Convention regarding grace regarding a term we'll talk about called election we mentioned this morning we mentioned that we are the elect I, I, I think it maybe hopefully made sense I don't know it might have been I don't know if it was a good illustration, but I said if your name was on a ballot and uh, God was voting, he'd vote for you. He would choose you. He would elect you. And that is a good thing. He chose you. He chose me. And then also the Bible teaches that we have a choice to make. We are the ones who can either accept God's free gift or deny it. Both of those positions are biblical. God shows us what the Bible says. We have the responsibility to say yes or no. That's what the Bible says. And so there are all these debates, and we're going to talk about that tonight. But before we do, let's go to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And if you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word, if you're able, as we read out of the first book in the Bible. We're going to start in the beginning on this topic. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Lord, we thank Abraham. And Lord, help us to understand what that is about and why, Lord, that was a gracious election and why that was good news and is good news for us today. 
Lord, we thank you for your sovereignty. Lord, we thank you for the ability you have given us to freely choose you or to choose to deny you. And Lord, we're just so thankful that, Lord, we're here tonight because of your grace. And Lord, we do choose you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Now, let's give a little background in Genesis. If you look in the first few chapters of Genesis, there's creation. But then pretty soon after creation, the fall, those episodes, you start getting into genealogies. And you say, why this genealogy? You get into the story of Noah and his sons and the flood. He had three sons. You start going, uh, well, let me back up. You have Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. Then you have this godly line of Seth, which is Adam and Eve's third child after Abel dies contrasted with the ungodly line of Cain. And so you go through Seth, you eventually reach Noah. Noah has three sons, then you continue with the line of Shem down to Abraham. But before that, you have this episode of the Tower of Babel. And what was happening at the Tower of, the, of Babel, you read in, an, in uh, I think it was chapter 10, it talks about Nimrod, and then in chapter 11 it talks about those who built the Tower of Babel, and they did it Why? If you go back and look, they want to make a name for themselves. They want to build this tower that reaches to the heavens. They don't want to fill the earth and subdue the earth and spread out over the face of the earth. They don't want to multiply and fill the earth, but they want to multiply in one place and make a name for themselves that is great. It's this first episode of uh, building monuments to oneself, of, of building honor and glory to oneself as opposed to this humble, oftentimes wilderness-wandering man named Abraham, who is a she- he's a shepherd, a keeper of flocks. He wanders about, it says, the Bible calls him a wandering Aramean. And he's called out from Ur of the Chaldees to go to a land that God would show him, which has oh so many theological implications. It's just like us journeying on our spiritual journey, in which we don't see the end from the beginning, but we have to go one step at a time. And Abraham's making this journey. He's looking for that house, the book of Hebrews says, that, was, that is made with a foundation, because he, he walks around in a tent. He's a wanderer. He has no sturdy house. But he's looking for that heavenly house that has a foundation and will not be moved. But here he is in chapter 12 of Genesis called out, and I want you to notice about two key things, two or three key things. Verse 2, it says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. As contrasted over against Tower of Babel, where they want to make their own name great. Here we have contrasted, really, God's grace versus man's work. Do you see it there? Oftentimes, and I've said this, when I go to the Hope Center and I share the gospel with people, when I, I ask them, I used to ask them, and I, I know you've heard this many times now, but I used to ask them, have you accepted Christ in your heart? Are you a Christian? Yada, yada, yada. They'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They'd all say yes. And I thought, you know, that's not very helpful. I need to really try to just be giving them an easy out. So I started asking them this question. If you were to die today and you were to appear before God and he'd say, why should I let you into heaven? What would your answer be? And then they begin to say, and many, over half, will say, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person, and I try to help people, and yada, yada, you know, I do good. And, and, in, and inevitably, over half will come and say something like that. And then I'll say, well, can I share with you from John chapter 3? And I'll read the story of Nicodemus. And I'll explain that we are saved through God's work, not ours. And that's the key focus tonight. God is the one who did all the work for salvation. He's the one who... From his throne on high, sent his son Jesus, the prince of heaven, down, emptied himself and made himself as a bondservant to do the work for us. Now that doesn't mean that we don't have the responsibility to choose him. And there's all these debates, and we'll get into that in a second. But he did the work. We'll put that off for just a little bit. Here in Genesis 12, it says in verse 2, I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. Notice there's this promise of blessing for others because of Abraham's choice, his, his gracious election. He is being graciously chosen by God, not really because of anything he's done. But we also know that God sees the heart, and there are all those workings to it. 
Way too complicated for me to try to explain or understand. But he knows Abraham's heart, but it's, but it's by grace. Verse 3, And I will bless those who bless you. Now notice this is, this is Christ coming from Abraham's loins. Do you see that? Those who bless Abraham will be blessed. And now today, those who bless Jesus will be blessed. This is him carrying the line of Christ. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And then notice, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so first thing I want you to see is that anytime the Bible speaks of election, it's always a good thing for the world. There are those who debate in our Southern Baptist life that God does predestine some to be saved and some to not be saved. And that's a hard pill to swallow for those of us who want to spread the gospel and see everybody saved. What do I say to that? Here's what I say. First of all, I don't agree with that, but I'll tell you why. I don't agree with that. But here's why. Notice here that Abraham is graciously chosen by God to be the carrier of God's plan, of his covenant, of God's purpose. The seed of Abraham will be the one who has the promise of God. But is it just for him? Is it, is, is it, in other words, when we talk about election, is it exclusive? I think exclusive, you know, club. You know, only those who are invited get to come to this country club and play golf and blah, blah, blah. Is it exclusive only if you're in this select group? Are you blessed? And, and many, without meaning to, they're well-meaning people and I love them and I have nothing against them. But many people, when they explain election, it sounds very exclusive. But that's not the, the way the Bible paints election. Notice when Abraham is chosen in verse 3, he says, And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So we see right away, God is choosing Israel. We won't go through all the passages about that, okay? Because, you know, we just don't have that time tonight. But notice that God's choosing Abraham, He's choosing Israel. is all part of God's gracious plan. You could talk about Esau and Jacob too. And even though Jacob is trying his best to get the blessing... It says in the scriptures that God uh, knew, he, he chose Jacob beforehand. It was told to Rebekah that the, the older would serve the younger, and, and it, it was already part of God's plan because it was by grace, and yet we still see Jacob doing that. And that's part of that interplay of God's sovereignty, our, uh, our uh, responsibility in choosing him, but, but I won't get into that. But all this to say, it's supposed to be a blessing, not a curse. It's not exclusive. This is the thesis I'm going to make tonight. Election in the Bible is an inclusive thing. It's meant to bless, not to keep out. You know, only this select few get to go to heaven. Everybody else is heaven. You know, it turns heaven into a country club that only a few can get to. That's just not what the Bible paints. The picture is, is not what the Bible paints. Let's continue on. Let's talk about free will. First Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. When you read the Bible, you just do not see, leaping off its pages, exclusivity. Heaven is not a country club. Heaven is a place where none of us deserve to get to be there. But we also read that hell was never designed for us, was it? It was designed for Satan and his angels. In other words, God's will is that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. But we have to say yes to that. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning in verse 4, we read of an instance that the Baptist faith and message quotes to show what man's free will is capable of. Notice this in, in 1 Samuel 8, 4. This is when the people tell uh, Samuel they don't want God to rule them through a judge anymore. You know, they don't want Samuel to be ruling them as a judge. They want a king. They want a king. Verse 4 of Sam, 1 Samuel 8, 1 Samuel 8, 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people. In regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And so here you have God. He's choosing Israel, and yet God will 
throughout their history, and by the way, this is not me being anti-Semitic, because remember, if Israel's having a hard go at it, Gentiles are not even hardly in the picture. You know, Israel's the best of the best and still having a hard time actually obeying God, okay? You get what I'm saying? And so Israel here, it, it, it's just a sad, sad picture. In fact, if I were to read one more verse in, in 1 Samuel 8, 8, he says, like all the deeds which they've done, since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day. In other words, they've been continually rejecting me all the time. And so we see that God's election is His grace to people who don't deserve Him. Grace. Go on to uh, Isaiah chapter 5. We're looking in the Old Testament as God indicts His people. As He brings judgment against them. He is prosecutor. He is judge, he is jury, he decides and he says, Israel, you're sinful, you're guilty. Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 5, the prophets all come along and they all have things to say about how Israel has not turned fully to their God, but they've turned and gone their own way. All like sheep have gone astray. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1 and notice this, this beautiful, it's like a song. This is God the Father singing to His beloved, his, his, who should have been His wife, right? Israel, his, his wife. Let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning His vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. So God is the one who is the... Uh, vineyard owner and keeper. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it, and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he, expect, he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? He says, I've done all I could for my vineyard to produce grapes. God's saying, I've done all I could do for Israel to produce good fruit of repentance. He says, what more could I have done? In the second part of verse 4, why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned nor hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold bloodshed for righteousness but behold a cry of distress he says i'm the one who's done everything i could for you and still you reject me now we have to try to explain that this is this is speaking about israel overall you know god always had a righteous remnant right a people elijah decries that all israel has gone astray and god tells him no i have a remnant of those who have not bowed the knee to baal and so there's, all, there's a remnant, but by and large, God has chosen Abraham's seed. He has blessed this nation, and this nation rejects him. Notice this is a picture of our ability as well to say no to God. We have the free will to say no. We have the ability to say, I will obey you, God, and obey. We have the ability to say, no, God, I won't, and not. God doesn't force you to do anything. And listen, this is too hard for me to wrap my head around. Let me just get that straight right off the bat. Anybody that tries to figure out how God can be sovereign, because here's what people do. If you go by human reasoning, you say, well, God is sovereign. Anything God tries to do, he succeeds at, right? Anything God wants to do, he'll do it, because he's all-powerful, right? El Shaddai, all-powerful, omnipotent. So if God wants to save people, they'll be saved. So how can God want to save people and they not get saved? Therefore, ergo, 
Those that God wants to save, He will, and those that He doesn't want to save, He won't. And of course, there are those passages in the Bible, such as in Romans and others, and we'll go over one of them if I get to it, that talk about election, and there you go. You have a full-fledged, logical system that says that if God is sovereign, then that must mean that He makes these people saved and these not. And what, what, what do the Scriptures tell us? And here's my thought with that. Anytime I try to put God in a logical box that's my logic, human logic, it will never work. And I could take my logic on the free will side and just as easily go a logical route and then say, yep, God's not sovereign. And that wouldn't be right either. So I could either say God's sovereign and man doesn't know what he's doing. If God makes him saved, he's saved and not, not. And say, there you go, there's my logic. Or I could go this way. And I could say, well, man has free will, therefore God's not sovereign because I get to choose. Ha, ha, ha. And guess what? I just, I just think, this is just me, maybe I'm wrong, I don't think so. I just happen to think that God is so strong and sovereign and above my pay grade and logic. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts, his ways higher than my ways, that maybe he's just so sovereign that he can sovereignly be sovereign and still sovereignly give me free will. And how that happens, I don't know, but the Bible says it, therefore it must be. I mean, I guess God's just that powerful. If I'm going to try to fit God in my little bitty logical box, why am I here? You know, why am I reading the Bible? This is the God we serve. He is sovereign, and yet he tells us all throughout the scriptures that he has given us the choice. Today, if you obey my voice. You know, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Today, if you obey my voice, he lays it out before them. If you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you're cursed. Your choice. I mean, it's, it's all throughout the Bible. And as is election. So they must go hand in hand. Further, Talk on this. Let's turn now one book over to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. I just think God is that sovereign that He can sovereignly give me free will and still be sovereign. I don't know how, but He's that good. He's that good. He's kind of like Chuck Norris. When Chuck Norris jumps in the lake, he doesn't get wet. The lake gets Chuck Norris. <laughs> All right. Jeremiah 31, 31. This is the talk of the new covenant. The new covenant. God tells us he's going to make a new covenant with his people. Jeremiah 31, 31. And the verses that follow. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. So look at how God is sovereignly orchestrating His plan all throughout the Bible. He knows what He's doing with Israel. As we've talked in prior sermons, as we've talked about, He sovereignly knew that Christ is coming in the flesh, the, the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, who has always been, but then He comes and enters history as a man, and God, God-man, Jesus, the son of Joseph, uh, as was supposed, the scriptures say, but he was really the son of God and still is. And it's all planned. God sovereignly worked it all out. God knew, hey, I'm going to have this whole new covenant thing. I'm going to you know, do this with Israel, and Israel's going to you know, uh, reject me, but I'll be gracious to them anyway. This is not you know, just harping on Israel, because remember, they're way better off than all the Gentiles around them. But this is a picture of what mankind does. God is gracious, mankind rejects. You have that few who go the narrow way and are saved, and it's just all God's grace. And he talks about this new covenant, this new way he's going to do things. But notice this is his work. He's going to say, look what it says in verse 33. 
I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. Then go to verse 34. They will not teach again each man his neighbor. Now you say, why do you have teachers in Sunday school, Brother Scott? I'll tell you. Because when the Scriptures tell us here that they'll not teach each man his neighbor, the Apostle Paul even mentions that. The Apostle Paul in his writings will talk about, he's there to exhort and to teach them, but he'll say, but you really have no need of anyone to teach you. Why is the Apostle Paul saying that? It's because they have the Holy Spirit within them. Jesus will talk to somebody and he'll say, it's not skin, uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. In other words, God is graciously entering into us and teaching us and working in our lives through His grace, even, get this, while we're yet sinners. That's, a, that's the good God we serve. God, in other words, it's a picture of God's grace. It's not, it's not saying there will never, ever again be teachers because the New Testament clearly tells us that uh, it talks about teachers. You know, teachers are held to double, double standard and pastors are to be good teachers and this and that. And so it's not saying there will never be, but it's saying the Holy Spirit's going to talk to you Himself. God is working out a gracious plan. It also includes the Gentiles. Turn to Luke chapter 2. We're going to see that God's gracious election, we're, we're trying to make this argument that it's not exclusive like some country club that I would never be able to afford to get into. You know, I can only afford to get into the Redneck Yacht Club. Nobody laughed at that. Redneck Yacht Club. But I can't get into that exclusive club and I can never get into heaven either. Because I just can't. I don't have the spiritual currency. But He lets me in. Luke 2, 29-32 says... Now, Lord, you are releasing... This is, by the way, Simeon after he sees Jesus. Remember uh, Anna and Simeon? Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. He's just seen baby Jesus as he's circumcised, right after he's circumcised. He says, you're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light of revelation to the Gentiles, that is to the nations, to the goyim in Hebrew. And the glory of your people Israel. He's quoting Isaiah. Uh, there are references to the Gentiles in Isaiah 9.2. We won't read them, but Isaiah 9.2, 42.6, 49.6 and 9, 51.4, chapter 60 verses 1 through 3, and in other places. Especially Isaiah. Isaiah saw that God's reach would eventually, his, his grace would eventually spread out and reach through the nations. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those, right, with good news, good tidings of good things, good news. God's will is that all the peoples will be blessed. Remember that Abraham, he told, in you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so his election of Israel and you go, when you go read in Revelation, we've been studying Revelation. When we get later in the book, it'll talk about the woman with the 12 stars and this and that on her crown. And, and any time you talk about 12, it's talking about Israel because the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's this woman Israel and she gives birth to the Savior and she's hidden in the wilderness. She, Israel, this nation of Abraham, is elect in order to bless. Not as an exclusive thing, but inclusive. If you don't believe me, let's go to another passage that talks about free will. Let's go now look to the free will portion again. Turn to Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verse 28. Matthew 21, 28. And we have the parable of the two sons. And I won't read it all, but in this... Jesus tells a, a story of one of it, a man had a vineyard and he tells his son, go work in it. And the son says, I won't. He tells another son, go work in the vineyard. And he says, okay, dad, I will. But guess what? The first son, who said that he wouldn't, later changes his mind, repents, and goes and works in the vineyard. And the son who said he would, doesn't go work in it. And Jesus says, which one do you think did the will of his father? And everybody, all the scribes and Pharisees are around, they say, well, I guess the one who went and worked, right? Even though he said he wouldn't, but then he did. 
And Jesus is making this explanation because he's surrounded by the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious people who really don't love others. They really don't uh, care about God's creation. You know, they're just really trying, they're whitewashed tombs. They're just trying to be religious without really caring about God. And then you have these prostitutes and sinners who are coming to Jesus and it makes everybody jealous. All the scribes and Pharisees are mad and that's not right and this and that. And Jesus is telling, hey, it's like that. Those who said, oh, well, we're doing what you say, Lord, really aren't. And those who are like, nah, we're not doing what you say, Lord, at, at the first, right? Prostitutes, sinners, they end up converting. But, but that's not what I'm talking about tonight. What I'm talking about is notice in the parable, the father told two sons to go out and work in the vineyard. And each son had a choice. You say, God's sovereign. Of course he's sovereign. But he also gives us free will. He gives these two sons a choice. The first son says, no, nah, I'm not going out in the vineyard. But then he does go. The second son, oh, I'll go, I'll go, Father, I'll go. But he doesn't. You see, we all have a choice before our God. Turn to Matthew 23. Turn about a page over. And Jesus further testifies to the fact that God, in God's sovereignty, He still gives us free will. Matthew 24, 37. This is Jesus. And this is the, his, his, you might call it Holy Week, right? This is His last week of ministry before His crucifixion. It's kind of this climax of His ministry. After three years, it reaches this culmination, this climax. And... After Jesus has been in the temple teaching, he looks over the city, and in Matthew 23, 37, this is the words of Jesus. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is Jesus' parting, one of his parting words to his people. And you say, well, Jesus, you're sovereign, you're God. Why don't you just gather them up? Gather up Israel's children and... And boom, just bl blast them with a, a light of pure light and heal them and bless them and make them all good. You can do it, Jesus. Go on. Just save them. Just, just blast them with your goodness and save them and change their hearts, change their minds, gather them up. He says, I long to do that. Jesus, you can do that, can't you? Yes. Jesus, you're sovereign, aren't you? Yes. But Jesus in His sovereignty sovereignly allows his people to make their own decision. He cries over them and says, and you were unwilling. He says, I wanted to bless you. I wanted to take care of you, but you're the one who has chosen to reject me. Jesus and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, triune in sovereignty, sovereignly allow us to say no or yes. It's our choice. Getting close to the end of our talk of our sermon tonight, I want you to turn to John chapter one. John chapter one, a, a, a chapter that is rich in theology. It teaches us about God. It teaches us about Jesus and how He is God. John chapter one. It also teaches us about salvation because John is all about salvation. John's explicit reason for writing his gospel. Is so that you would believe, he says. These things are written so that you might believe. John, and all the Gospels are about evangelism, but John just explicitly, clearly states, I wrote this so that you'll believe. But even John, even the evangelist, he believes in God's sovereignty. He believes that God is the one who is the originator of all salvation. Turn, look at verse 12 of chapter 1. John 12, excuse me, John 1, verse 12. He says, referring to Jesus, to us and Jesus, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. 
who were born, look at this, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now why is John saying this? John, why are you saying that it's all by God's will? Because it is. Because He's so good to us. Because He's so powerful. He said, why are you telling us that it's by God's will, not man's will? Because if you look back at Genesis, if you look back at Tower of Babel versus Abraham, what were the people of the Tower of Babel trying to do? Build their way up to heaven, weren't they? They were trying to get to God. How? By their own ability. And so when John says that th these who have come to Christ were born of the will of God, he's not saying, oh, listen, everybody, you know that we're all, God is sovereign and He's the one choosing, yes, you, you, no, no, yes, you, uh, you, no, no. He, carving out for himself a people, all the rest of you, uh, just get away, just these people. That's not John's message. If you look at the message of the Bible, you'll get the meaning of it. He is not trying to carve out an exclusive country club. John is telling us that this is by God's will so that you and I might be humble because we are not to be like those at the Tower of Babel who say we are building our way up to God. Because that's what over half of the people who come to the Hope Center and talk to me about salvation say. They say, well, I'm a pretty good person. Eh, wrong. You know, that's, that's wrong. John is telling us that it's by God's will so that it will be humbling. So that we will humbly see, oh God, you did the work. He's not trying to carve out an exclusive country club called heaven. He's trying to keep us humble. He is keeping us humble. God is telling us, you didn't do this, I did. While, you were, yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We, we couldn't do it on our own. He did it for us. John is saying this because it's grace to us. It, it's, it's blessing to us. And furthermore, because none of us can reach anyway, and because we're all excluded from the kingdom, Jesus decided to graciously include all of us who will come to Him. Go over to John 3.16, and it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him, shall not perish but have eternal life. He is including everybody. Because guess what? Everybody got excluded by sin, and now by Jesus' gracious work on the cross, everybody's included. And so even when it's sovereignty, it's God's sovereignty. Why? So that He may great show us grace. So God's sovereign, yes, but so that He might show us grace. Two more scriptures and we're done tonight. Turn to 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9 I, I really love this passage. 2 Peter 3.9 2 Peter 3.9 towards the end of your Bible. Right before 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. 2 Peter 3.9 This is describing to us sovereign free will. Look at this. It's talking about God and His will and then it's talking about the, inclu the inclusivity of it all. Uh, his sovereign free will that he, he gives, in his sovereignty, he gives us free will. 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The Lord's not willing that any should perish. Now, I was having a, ten, uh, I won't call it an argument. It was a cordial Christian discussion. Uh, when I first sensed the call to the ministry, I had the pleasure, and really it, was, it did me a lot of good. Uh, I worked at Lifeway. I had the pleasure, this was back in 2011. When I first got back from Brazil, Gabby and I did, and I was getting ready to go to seminary. Uh, Y'all remember the recession, right? I had a degree in computer science, but I had no experience. Um, all the jobs were getting taken up by people who had been laid off, and, and us new guys, you know, were just out, and I'd apply and apply and apply and get nothing. And so I went to work for Lifeway down in Nashville with, at the headquarters there, what used to be, had the big tower and the cross, remember that? It had a warehouse beside it. The warehouse had already been moved to Lebanon, the main function, the functioning of the warehouse, the D.C. distribution center, over on at Lebanon, and the warehouse was empty, wasn't used for anything. 
So they were still putting together some new stores. They, they turned into a staging warehouse. So we would receive a whole lot of product, Bibles, books, DVDs, you know, plush toys, you know, for the kids, all the kids stuff. We'd receive it all, scan it in, ticket it, and put it in the right shelf. And we'd fit a whole, we fit the whole Hot Springs, Arkansas, Lifeway store. I can still almost remember the number. It was almost, it was like number 9463, something like that. I don't think it was that high of a number, but I, I can almost remember the number. And we would we put it all in one tractor trailer truck and shipped it to our, they sent it to Arkansas on shelves, mobile shelves. But there were about four or five of us working there. And there was another young man who was considering going to seminary. And he was considering Southern Seminary, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary up in Louisville. And their president is Dr. Al Moeller. And he's a Calvinist. Um, he's a Calvinist. A Calvinist is somebody who believes in, you know, predestination. They believe that God is so elect, or so sovereign that he does elect some people to salvation and others not. And as you hopefully have by now have figured out, I am not Calvinist. And so, and back then I was, a, I was kind of a militant non-Calvinist. And seminary really taught me to be more understanding um, of the position because of the sovereignty in the Bible. I consider it now God's sovereign and we have free will. But back then, whew, I did not like Calvinism at all. I really still don't. And, but I had problems with Calvinists, you know. And, I mean, now I accept and understand, but we'll talk more about that in a second. But we were having a tense discussion. We'd just be there ticketing books and, you know, a bunch of the theology, you know, a bunch of Christians who are working at Lifeway discussing Calvinism. Ooh, that makes for a tense work environment. And we're ticketing books, and he's saying something, and I'm saying something, and I'm thinking, come on, everybody else, join in. Let's get them. Come on. And I'm like, come on, help them here. And we're ticketing books, and I'm giving him this, and he's giving me that. And he's talking about Southern Seminary, and so I know I'm not going there. And that's when I, you know, but, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But I, I said to him, I said, 2 Peter 3, 9, or I don't think I quoted the, the reference, but I said, you know, it says, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And here was his response. His response was, well, if you look in the context of the book, he's speaking to the churches, and so he's really just talking to the churches, and it's not his will that any of the church people perish, you know, of the, of the elect. And, and that was the argument, and that's, you know, a high and mighty theological argument that he's talking to the churches, and, you know, and I'm just like, What? That is a big bunch of hogwash. And when I look through it, I have to at least kind of sort of see, well, he's talking to the church, but guess what? We believe that you are once saved, always saved. And that's another topic for another day. We covered that on a Wednesday night. If you want to go see it, watch it on YouTube or Facebook. We won't rehash it now. But all through, and I, we believe that. Once you're saved, God's got you. He's going to make you stand in that day. But all throughout the, the New Testament books, there are all these warnings to check your heart. To not be those that God had to lay low in the wilderness because of their disbelief in the book of Hebrews. And so I say in 2 Peter, he's warning people to make sure they're in the faith because he wants them to get to heaven. And then he says, and then he says it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I just got to say, I just don't think that's limited just to the churches. I think it's Peter expressing God's sovereign overall care for the world. And we've talked about it in other scriptures. Yes, he's referring to these churches, but he, to these people who are Christians, but he's saying don't be unbelievers or you'll go to hell. In which case, they wouldn't be Christians. In which case, his argument is, but God don't want you to go to hell. He wants all people to be saved. I believe all means all. Yes, you could try to say it's to the churches, but in the context, he's saying if you don't believe, you'll go to hell, and it's God's will that none should perish. That's talking about everybody. Unbelievers. It's his will that they will come to him and not be lost. One more section of Scripture. But by the way, just a footnote on that. That's why, and I have nothing against Southern Seminary. I just want to make that clear. All you out on there on the internet, love Southern Seminary. However, I did, it did cause me to do research. I found out that Dr. Moeller, the president at Southern, and Dr. Paige Patterson, the president at Southwestern, had had a friendly debate, not at all unkind, but they'd had a friendly debate at one of the Southern Baptist Convention meetings. I kind of researched a little bit about that. It piqued my interest, 
in the Southwestern, because that's where Dr. Patterson was president. I didn't just go because of that, but Gabby and I took a trip to Southwestern. We stayed, they'll, they'll let you stay in the hotel uh, that they've got for conferences, the conference center and all that, and tour campus. And when we got there, we just felt the overwhelming voice of God telling us that was the place for us. And so it wasn't just because I wasn't a Calvinist that I decided to go to Southwestern, but it ended up leading me in that direction. And, and God, he, I felt his call to go there. Could have gone to others too, but we felt his, his, his overwhelming voice to us to go there. But because I, I, I just believed that God wishes to see everybody saved. Now my last scripture I'm going to read, or section, is in Romans 8. And then we'll be done tonight. Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans is the book par excellence. As if, of course, all the, all the Bible's excellent. But it is the book par excellence about salvation. You want to know about salvation? Read Romans. That's why we have the Romans road for, of salvation. It's all about it. And what's furthermore, it's all about how God has graciously elected the Jewish nation, Israel, and yet some of them have rejected Him. God has made them jealous by the Gentiles so that He will draw them to Himself. So that he, and if you look at the beginning of Romans, it says the Gentiles in chapter 1 sinned, God has turned them over, remember, to a reprobate mind. He's given them over to the desire and lust of their flesh. Then he says in Romans 2, and you who have the law and don't keep it, you're no better. So, so Paul is saying that God has put both of them, allowed both of them to be in a state of lostness so that he may show grace to them both. And I want to get there, and I, it's just so good. Romans 8.28 says these words. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, sovereignty, to those who love God, free will, to those who are called according to His purpose, sovereignty, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom He predestined, He also called, and these whom He called, He also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. This is, uh, I forget, this is called like the chain of justification or the chain of salvation. The golden chain. It's like this golden steps that go down. Or go up, I should say. And uh, the golden chain, I think it's called. And, and, and many will say, you see here, this is God choosing only some. There are others who will say, well, look, it says those whom he foreknew. And I don't really want to get into that discussion. If you know what I'm talking about, I don't want to get into it right now. But notice why he's saying this. The Apostle Paul is teaching us not that God chose because he's being exclusive. He's putting together a country club and only they get in. He's showing us that it's by grace. It's not by works. Don't believe me? Look at the very next verse, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, in other words, He gave us Jesus, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? But what could hamper that? Verse 33, our sin. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies what is our overarching problem? What, why, what, is Satan, what is Satan's main tool against us? He is called the what of the brethren? The accuser. Sin is the problem. Our sin, when we sin, Satan goes, Aha, look, your child sinned. Cast him into hell. And Jesus graciously says, No, I have paid for it. And so when Paul is talking about election, it's grace. Still don't believe me? I will submit to you, and I'm not going to read it all, but chapters 9, 10, and 11 focus on Israel. And how can Israel be the elect of God? And many of them reject their Messiah, Jesus. Of course, if you, don't, you, know, if you haven't gotten that message from the Old Testament, go back and reread it. But, he said, but peop, he's, ar he's arguing against somebody who would argue with him. He's writing this out, but he's... he's, he's Responding to his critics, his, his critics who would argue against him. He, he says in Romans chapter 9 verse 1, and I'm just going to read a verse here or there. I'm telling you the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief 
in my heart, for I wish that I could myself were accursed, separated for, from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. In chapter 10, verse 1, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. He goes on in verse, chapter 11, verse 1, I say then, God has not rejected His people, has He? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. He goes on to make this claim that God has not rejected His people. But then he goes to something very interesting. He goes to verse 11. We're in Romans eleven eleven. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? In other words, the Jews are not rejected forever. He starts to make this argument that the Jewish nation experience this hardening of the heart so that Gentiles will come in. Then he says, don't you Gentiles think you got it all going on now? He, he argues for our humility. He says in Romans eleven eleven, May it never be, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now if there the Jews transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles how much more will their fulfillment be verse 16 if the per first piece of dough is holy the lump is also verse 17 but if some of the branches were broken off and you so he starts to talk about this olive tree and he says the Jewish nation these branches are broken off and wild olives are grafted in but notice what he says Verse 22, Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fail, severity. But to you, God's kindness. If you continue in His kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. He says, you Gentiles, if Gentiles don't believe, they too will not be in the tree. That is this olive tree that represents God's kingdom. And then he says in verse 23, And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, in other words, if Jews don't keep unbelieving, he says they'll be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. And he says in verse 26, And so all Israel will be saved. Verse 28, From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And then notice his conclusion in verses 31 in 30, let's, let's, I want you to really, I know we've gone over a lot tonight, but this is my last part, and it's so good. I love this. I love this. It's so good. Romans eleven thirty, For just as you were once disobedient to God, meaning a bunch of filthy Gentiles off here in nowhere land, off in you know, our ancestors in Europe, and pagan as all get out in northern Europe, western Europe, other places. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. So these also now have been disobedient, meaning, it says, just as you were disobedient, Gentiles, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. So these also now have been disobedient, meaning the Jews, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. In other words, God has allowed everybody to sin so He can show us mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that He may show mercy to all. And He ends this long discussion in Romans from which many Calvinists get their doctrine, okay? Many Calvinists go to Romans and say, Aha, see, God chooses some, He chooses others to go to hell. And I'm just going to draw them to the end of the theolog this is the end of his long discussion on salvation and in, in chapter 12 he'll go on to the practical right the practical things of the Christian life he sums up his entire argument for those who are a Calvinist who want to say God chooses some and not others I say go to the end of his argument and he sums it all up with this God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to who? all and then he goes into a doxology a praise a, an, a, an overwhelming glory to God session in which he says oh it's, it has to have an exclamation mark at the end 
Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. He sums up the entire argument of Romans in that everybody's a sinner so that God could show mercy to everybody. And all that to say, Article 5, the Baptist Faith and Message states, Election, this is the Baptist Faith and Message now, not the Scriptures, but it's drawn from all these Scriptures. Election is the gracious purpose of God according to which He regenerates, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. It is consistent with the free agency of man and comprehends all the means in connection with the end. It is the glorious display of God's sovereign goodness and is infinitely wise, holy, and unchangeable. It excludes boasting and promotes humility. That's the first section of it. The section deals with eternal security. We won't read that part. It says it excludes boasting and promotes humility. I believe that God is sovereign. I believe that He elects His people. I also believe that He's sovereign enough to give us the choice. And He calls us to make that choice. Tonight, if you have never accepted Jesus, He calls you to do so. He has shut up all in disobedience so that He may show mercy to all. If you've never accepted Christ, tonight would be a good time. As our musicians come forward, and as we stand tonight, if you've never accepted Christ, this would be a wonderful moment to do so. If you... uh, have accepted Christ, but maybe you've not appreciated God's goodness to you in His election, you can give that to Him now. Why don't we sing our hymn of invitation? And why don't you if, you, if you do nothing else, just spend this time praying to God and thanking Him that He chose you and that He loves you. Let's sing tonight. thine own way is a wonderful song to sing when we're talking about election god's gracious election to us have your own way lord but it's his way that you would be saved because he's that good remember that this week we have our uh, services that we have tuesday night wednesday night and we have women on mission tomorrow night and and maybe some other i think some other things perhaps men's bible study and women's bible study got a lot lot this week also next sunday morning don't um miss our te- our in- are we off brother keith i'll just cut my mic off 